Dave Brown uh, wrote in his blog, and his blog was titled, Swimming Against the Tide. The trajectory of our culture is away from God. And without energy and commitment, we will be swept downstream, going with the flow. And you know, going with the flow actually takes no energy at all. I mean, even a dead fish can be carried a long way by the current. But if we have been made alive in Christ, that cannot be our reaction. Our call as Christians is to grow in Christ's likeness, to become more like our Savior uh, in His holiness, in, in the fruit of the Spirit. All that takes an effort and energy and, and commitment. So we're not just battling against our own sinful nature, and, and that's a hard enough struggle on its own. But in our day, we are also battling against the current of our culture, which seeks to drag us away from Jesus Christ. Making progress is hard, but you know, giving up for a moment means we'll have a, a further swim later on. So are you ready and willing to allow Christ to make a difference in your life? That's the question that we have to look at this morning. Uh, some of you here, I know you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, there may be those of you here who have not. And so either way, uh, this message is very relevant in that it may speak to you about making that decision in your life or uh, enable you to speak to others in that regard. So are you ready to swim against the tide? That is the question. Uh, and have I ever had a conversion experience? You might think about that as well. I mean a real, genuine, honest-to-goodness conversion experience. Maybe you um, have converted from Ford to Chevrolet, or maybe McDonald's to Burger King. Maybe for you it was uh, from Iowa to Illinois, the Illini. Maybe uh, Cubs to Cardinals, perhaps, or of course Chicago Bears to the Indianapolis Colts. Have you ever had a true conversion experience? You know, some of you may remember the old cigarette commercial. I don't think there are many of those on TV anymore, but there used to be numerous. But uh, back in the 60s, I'd rather fight than switch was one. You know, this morning I want to look at a man who truly had a, a conversion experience. The Apostle Paul uh, did make a big switch uh, in his life. And that switch, or, or conversion, if you will, was from Saul, the legalistic Jew, to Paul, the, the loving Christian. And when he did, his whole purpose and passion for life changed. So let us learn from Paul's experience as we get into our text today. I encourage you to turn to Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at uh, Ephesus. Uh, you know, the uh, letter to the church of Ephesus was actually a circular uh, letter. In other words, it was passed along to uh, the other churches, and uh, Paul's first churches were kind of in a circular fashion. If I had a map, I'd show you, but, uh, but that's why a circular letter, and it circulated. And, and so uh, to the point that it has circulated down uh, to you and me today, it's part of God's canon, God's word. And so Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 is what I would like for us to look at. So if you just kind of follow along as I read from the word of our Lord. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, here's, here's the mystery, okay? Through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise 
in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to say in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. Won't you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, uh, help us to be totally sold out to you. Father, if we are one who has made a decision to give our lives to you and to follow you, we pray that you would strengthen us each day uh, to live for you. That when people see us, that they will see there goes the body of Christ. That people see that in our action, in our words, um, the very life of Christ. Strengthen us, Father, through your word this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I hope you picked up an outline on the way in. I had a little trouble with the copy machine upstairs this morning. Had to actually ask someone to teach my Sunday school class, but they graciously did while I went home and used my slow printer to print, print an outline. Uh, but that's okay. That's neither here nor there. My only point is, is that you have an outline if you pick one up on the kitchen counter, and they are there uh, every week. I like to have an outline with the, uh, each message that I give. But we see from our text in, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul considered himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. Now, a Gentile is uh, anyone who is not uh, a Jew, okay? So probably most all of us in this room, uh, we are Gentiles. And earlier in Paul's letter, God had asked the, the called out ones, if you will, uh, those who were close to him, and once again, that would be the Jews, uh, to him because of their relationship with Father Abraham. He asked them to make a covenant with him, and he would be their God, and in return, they would be obedient to him. Now, all that takes place in Genesis chapter 12, if you'd like to make a note and do a little bit of research there, Genesis uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, he would be their God. In return, they would be obedient to him. And a sign of that covenant would be that all males would be circumcised. Now, when Jesus Christ came into the picture, uh, that all changed. Uh, when one accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, God wrote the laws upon their hearts. And their obedience was referred to as circumcision of the heart. And so, therefore, circumcision of the flesh... Uh, was no longer uh, necessary uh, and, you know, perhaps still uh, done, but by uh, other reasons other than declaring that you are a, a Jew or a Gentile. So uh, please turn with me, though, if you would, please, to Philippians chapter 3. Maybe we can clear this up uh, just a little bit. Philippians, uh, we have Ephesians and then Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, Paul's uh, letter to the uh, church of Philippi. And so, uh, I, you know, I want you to hear Paul's response, uh, his comments about circumcision of the flesh for Christians, okay? This is after Christ. But I also want for you to hear his credentials and his resume. Paul had quite uh, a resume going for him. So Philippians chapter 3 we're going to take a look, first of all, at verses 2 and 3, but don't run off because we're going to stick around in Philippians for a while. Uh, but in chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit came upon those who accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord as their Lord and Savior, which we learn in Acts uh, 2.38. Uh, 
who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Um, and so the, the flesh meaning uh, the law, if you will. Though I myself has reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And so I'm just going to go on here through uh, verse 6. And that is, Paul said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. So he was um, a, a Jew and still is, if you will, other than the fact that Gentiles tells us, in, other than the fact that Galatians tells us that there are no more Jews and Gentiles and uh, women and men. You know, we're all one in Christ Jesus, if you will. So, but Paul was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He said, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he was definitely a Jew. In regard to the law, he was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee is about as high as you can go if you're going to uh, obey the law, if you will. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic uh, righteousness, he said, I was uh, faultless. So uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, prior to his conversion in Christ, he had those credentials. I mean, he was a Jew uh, of the Jews, for sure. And so that's his response. Paul is talking uh, to the Gentiles, and he goes on to say, in verses 7 through 11, because amongst the Jews, Paul was the elite. I mean, he was the cream of the crop, if you will. He excelled in, in all things, even in his zeal in persecuting the church. But listen what he said as far as his conversion is concerned, beginning in verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. I mean, all of this history of the Apostle Paul. But he says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more... I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, listen to this, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings because like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's where Paul is as he uh, faced uh, <clears throat> his conversion. So Paul became a prisoner of Christ Jesus and his calling as we see in verse uh, 2 of our text. Finally, the brothers rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. And again, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil. And, uh, but his calling uh, was the administration of God's grace, which we read about in uh, chapter uh, 2. So... Um, I'd like to look at uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, if you will, while you're still there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And then if you go over to chapter 2 of uh, Ephesians, chapter 2, and take a look at uh, verse uh, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. In other words, no more Jew, no more Gentile, but all one. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So we see that the Apostle Paul being in prison, uh, which is where he is writing in Philippians, uh, did not consider himself a victim of the Jews, nor a victim of Nero, 
the emperor of Rome, he was in prison. Why? Because he was passionate about what it was that he was doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is what God had called him to do and what he chose to do. You know, some of you may have heard of the preacher Greg Lowry. Uh, Greg is a pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside, California. And he wrote an article back in the day, if you will, uh, that said Tom Brady was a quarterback for the New England Patriots. Uh, he, he went on to write, and again, this was kind of back in the day, that he has three Super Bowl rings in his possession. That is the time of this writing, of course. He now has, by the way, six Super Bowl uh, wins with the New England Patriots and then, of course, Tampa Bay. Uh, but Greg Larry goes on to write, you would think that uh, that would be pretty satisfying resume. Uh, you'd imagine a young man in his shoes to be on top of the world. And yet, Greg writes, in a moment of honest reflection in an interview on CBS 60 Minutes, Brady said this. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still feel like there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is it. Uh, I, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. And, but he said, me, I think that God has got to be more than this. And so he was then asked, well, what's the answer? And he said, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. And he replied, I love playing football and I love being quarterback for this time. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. Uh, those are good words by Tom Brady. Now, to be honest with you, I've not followed his spiritual life uh, to this point. Uh, but I hope he did something with that. Because he said at the very pinnacle of his career in his game, Tom Brady couldn't seem to put his finger on a driving purpose for his life. It reminds me of an uh, ad I saw in a magazine. Uh, it showed a picture of a guy looking into his mirror as he was shaving. Uh, and he said this, is it an alarm or a calling that gets you out of bed in the morning? Each and every one of us could ask ourselves that question. Is it an alarm or a calling that gets us out of bed in the morning? It's a good question. And we can ask ourselves, what is it that we live for? What, what is it that makes us tick? What gets you up in, in the morning? You know, all of us need something, <clears throat> excuse me, to live for. Some passion or ideal that will drive us on, that will give us life, purpose, meaning raising it above the level of, of just more existence. We don't want our lives on earth just to be some passing blip on the screen of time. We want to mark. We want to, we might want to make a difference. And I believe that's true of each and every one of us in this room, at least to some degree. You know, a group from a church went out on the street, and it was kind of one of them man-on-the-street deals, uh, to ask, uh, what do you live for? What do you live for? The answers that they received were fairly predictable. I want to live comfortably for the rest of my life was one answer. I live for girls and money was another. And yet another, I just want to be happy. Well, how would you answer that question this morning? How would you answer that question? You know, something to ponder. What would you say is the master passion of your life even today? What's your reason for living? What's your reason for getting up in the morning? What gets your blood pumping? You know, if you had to sum it all up in one word or phrase, what would it be? What would it be? A poll on Oprah's show a few years back worded the question like this, what is your life's mission? What is your life's mission? 70% of the people who responded to that poll had absolutely no idea. Zero. What is your life's mission? The fact is many people are enduring life rather than enjoying their lives. Their favorite day of the week is someday. Someday their ship will come in. Someday they'll get the promotion build the dream house, take the cruise, find that perfect relationship, or retire in a nice, sunny climate. 
You know, an astonishing 94% of the people who responded to Oprah's survey, they said that they were just enduring the present while waiting for something better to happen. Just enduring the present while while waiting for something better to happen. You know, that's essentially what Tom Brady said. There has to be something more out there. And there was a few more Super Bowl rings. We talked about that briefly. But there's a good chance that he's still searching for that something. You know, John Lennon, who I think most of you are familiar with, the Beatle, once said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Sadly, he was killed by a deranged fan when he was only 40 years old. You cannot help but wonder if Lennon considered that death is also what happens when you're busy making other plans. Here's what you need to know. Only those who are prepared to die are really ready to live. Only those who are prepared to die are really ready to live. If Oprah had interviewed the Apostle Paul, he would have stated that his life mission, and he would have stated it like this, as you'll find recorded in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ. That would be his answer. For me to live is Christ. That was his answer. After his conversion, Paul was a balanced, practical man who cared deeply about people and believed with all his heart that his message could give people a purpose for life. Restore marriages, build families, shatter addictions, bring unprecedented hope, balance, and happiness to men and women all over the world. He could not wait to get up in the morning to tell people about it. The second half of Paul's summary of life went like this. For me to live is Christ. You'll find that still in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. But he went on to say, and to die is gain. And to die is gain. There are some who would simply say, to live is just to live. Just to live. What a life of futility. Life to them means mere existence, kind of an animal condition, if you will. They have no philosophy to speak of. They don't uh, take time to contemplate life's meaning, and they seek to satisfy their desires no matter how bizarre or deviant they might be. You know, this type of person will get very uncomfortable with any discussion about life and its ultimate meaning. They'll say, I really don't want to talk about it. I just do not talk about it. You see, when Paul opened his eyes in the morning, he could say, hey, if I live another day, I get to serve the one that I love more than anyone else in the world. And if I die before bedtime tonight, I'll be in heaven in his presence. How can I go wrong? <laughs> you can't go wrong. Life and death, win-win. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. You know, the Apostle Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. He chose to be a prisoner to his calling. Secondly, the Apostle Paul said, and if you'd look with me, please, in verses uh, 7 and 9, back to our text of Ephesians chapter 3. We'll get, get in our text occasionally. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. And you know, that's the same mission that God gave to each and every one of us. In Matthew chapter 28 is to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. 
and then go on teaching them all that I have taught you while I was here on earth to become Christ-like for each and every one of us. But Paul said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. You know, all of us need something to get out of bed in the morning besides the alarm clock. For the Apostle Paul, it all boiled down to Jesus Christ. And even though he spent his last few months in a dungeon and left this life courtesy of a Roman executioner, he died a happy, fulfilled man without even one Super Bowl ring. So let's go back to Philippians 3, if you would, please, for a moment. Because Paul goes on to say in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Please go back with me to 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul became a servant of the gospel. So you need to go back towards the front, Acts, Romans, and then you get into Corinthians. Once again, Paul's letter, they're all right together. This is his letter to the church at Corinth. But if you go to chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians and begin in verse 19, Paul said, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. Verse 20, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law. And then verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. And that means we obey all the laws. Why? Because of what Christ Jesus did for us. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You know, the Apostle Paul became a servant of the gospel. Before his conversion, Paul did everything he could to stamp out Christianity. He stood by and he held the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. You read about that in the book of Acts. He dragged Christian men and women out of their houses and put in prison. He obviously hated Christians and Christianity, and yet he made the switch and became a follower of Christ. How did it happen? Well, what did happen? Okay, here we go again. Let's go back to Acts. Everybody must be using their phones. I don't hear a lot of pages being turned this morning. There we go. Thank you. I know, you just flipped your outline over, didn't you? I uh, know. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, if you would, please. And, uh, or, yeah, Acts chapter 9. And verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that is Christianity, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, 
but did not see any more. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see a thing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Well, the scripture goes on to say that uh, Paul, it was Saul at the time who became Paul, uh, had all that removed from his eyes. He came face to face with Jesus Christ there on the road to Damascus, was humbled, he got knocked to the ground. And my friends, you know, if you've ever been knocked down in some form, whatever that might be in life, we all, we all are from time to time, please realize that it might, just might be the Lord trying to uh, tell us something. Some people get knocked down by various tragedies, but still don't look up. Well, you and me, we can look up. We can look up to God and say, God, what is it that you're trying to teach me here? Let's go on, though, in verse 15 and 19. We've got just a little bit more time here. Um, I'm talking about Acts chapter 9 still, beginning in verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show how much he must suffer for my name. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, he was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. You know, there's only one place to find true lasting change, and that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. You know, Paul, writing from prison to the church at Ephesus and beyond, had suffered often as a result of his calling. But Paul knew that he would suffer for the Lord transforming from the old way to life to the new difficult. Going against the ways of the world can be painful, but the Apostle Paul found it well worth the journey. You know, Dave Brown in his blog that we talked about from the very beginning there, Against the Tide, Swimming Against the Tide, you know, as we feed on Christ through his word, as we rest in Christ in prayer, and as we stand next to one another, here in fellowship and witness and, ser and serve him, we will gradually swim upstream and grow more and more in the likeness of Jesus Christ our Lord. And that, my friends, is where we truly belong. I'd like to ask praise team if they begin to make their way forward. Uh, my question for you this morning, though, is are you willing to humble yourselves and become a servant of the gospel? And if you happen to be here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come. And, uh, you know, we can talk privately about that and uh, make arrangements for you to uh, do that if that's where the Lord is leading you and to be baptized uh, into him. Um, but the question again is, are you willing to go through the growing pains every day as we continue to follow Christ? You know, I want to tell you about a man one afternoon in Chicago, a group of ball players they, they entered a saloon. And when they emerged, they saw a group of people playing instruments, singing gospel hymns, and testifying of, of Christ's power to save from sin. Memories of a log cabin in Iowa, in an old church, and a godly mother raced through the mind of one of these ball players. Tears came to his eyes, and presently he said, Boys, I'm through. I'm going to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. We've come to the parting of our ways. And some of his companions mocked him, but others were silent. Only one encouraged him, and he turned from the group, and he entered the Pacific Garden Mission. Later, that ball player told what occurred. He said, I called upon God's mercy. I staggered out of my sins into the outstretched arms of a Savior. That ball player was Billy Sunday, who became known as a world-renowned evangelist and probably preached Christ to more people at that time than any other preacher. You know, Billy Sunday 
had an unusual conversion experience, perhaps not as extreme as the Apostle Paul's, but a bit unusual nonetheless.